Okay, so uh, this is the third and final uh, lecture on issues associated with evolutionary theory. Uh, the first one, of course, was just providing you with some quantitative information on the population genetic environment, rates of mutation, drift, and recombination. And the second was focused on more classical theoretical issues and population genetic theory, where we <clears throat> have developed formulations for predicting rates of change in gene frequencies across time. But the big challenge now for the field <clears throat> in general is connecting these changes of allele frequencies to actual biological traits, which isn't uh, so easily done. But the closer we get to the DNA at the molecular and cellular level, the, the better the chance we have to do this. But today's uh, talk is focused on uh, thinking about the origins of complexity and, and novel functions in different organisms, particularly in eukaryotes. And it's a common view among most biologists that complexity is a good thing and uh, biological complexity represents the crown jewel, if you like, of the awesome power of natural selection with animals, humans in particular, representing the pinnacle of what natural selection can accomplish. This is kind of an odd uh, way to think about things. As, as far as I know, there's no evidence that increases in complexity are intrinsically advantageous. Might be true, but it'd be nice to have some hard evidence demonstrating that it is true. And there's also no evidence that biology's metabolic, morphological, behavioral features have reached a pinnacle as well. So those of you who come here with not a lot of background in evolution might have read Darwin. It's been a long time since Darwin was around. Of course, his whole book was focused on natural selection. Or you might have read Richard Dawkins, who also is a hardened adaptationist. And these are potentially giving you somewhat jaded views of how the evolutionary process works. So the problem with complexity is it uh, invokes energetic cost. The more complex your organism, the more mutationally vulnerable it is to being broken. So one could argue that whenever possible, all other things being equal, natural selection should always favor simplicity over complexity. And yet, and I put this in quotes, there's many aspects in cell biology, as we'll see today, that are arguably over-designed, especially in eukaryotes, and even more so in multicellular species. So the, the thing we'll be emphasizing today is that, uh, of course, there is a tendency in eukaryotes and multicellular species to become more complex morphologically compared to bacteria. And we'll see just the basic structural features of biology themselves combined with population genetic processes provide a platform for the natural expansion of complexity in certain phylogenetic lineages. We expect this to happen in many cases, even if it's not driven by natural selection. So to kind of put things in context, let's, let's take a look at this little diagram here to the left. Imagine you're an alien budding evolutionary biologist that's somehow landed on the planet Earth, apparently on one of the poles and the only thing you know about evolution, you read this book by Darwin and read this quote and liked it very much from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And there's a tendency for biologists to think that anything that's beautiful and diverse must be a consequence of natural selection, must have been driven by natural selection. So you find these little things there up on the North Pole and you're trying to, you're mesmerized by the beautiful forms here. And you start testing various hypotheses about why these were driven by selection. Maybe they're buoyancy adaptations among these potentially different species, but that doesn't work out so well. Or maybe they're anti-predatory adaptations, each one being subject to a different kind of predator, but gee, there's no predators out there. Oh, maybe it's sexual selection. So you're attracting mates uh, with these various ornamentations. So that doesn't work out either. If anything, these are asexual, but wait, they're not even reproducing. You spend your entire career going down this path of hypothesis after hypothesis, all based on adaptation. And finally, your amused colleague sitting next door in his office after 30 years asked you to, whether you ever checked if there's actually any carbon in these organisms. And you 
fall down, collapse into a heap on the floor, and you just wasted your entire career going down this one path. Well, these are biology snowflakes. So we'll learn more about this later. But uh, what we know is the vast majority of proteins in organisms don't uh, operate as single monomers, but often as dimers, trimers, tetramers, and so on. And in many cases, uh, we'll see later, uh, there's no new function acquired by having these interfaces. In many cases, there are. But there's many situations which a particular enzyme might wander through these different multimeric states in, in different phylogenetic lineages and no evidence that there's a, a net benefit having been acquired. One area in biology uh, that we know of uh, that provides very good evidence for additions of complexity uh, to organisms is the genome level. And so if you look at, um, we now know uh, gene structure and genome structure in literally tens of thousands of organisms from whole, whole genome sequences. So at the top, we have sort of the Prius of the, the biological world, prokaryotic genome. This is the structure of a gene. You can see there's two of them here tied together quite closely. Uh, genes in prokaryotes have continuous open reading frames, very little intergenic DNA. Uh, very simple uh, regulatory regions upstream of genes. In some cases, not at all, because genes are sometimes uh, transcribed in polycystronic units and operons. And then we move to the, the situation below. Eukaryotic uh, typical gene structure is illustrated here, not to scale. If you think about the human genome or any other eukaryotic genome, our genes are uh, subdivided. We have these small islands of exons, the coding DNA in blue, subdivided by these large stretches of non-coding DNA, intergenic se sequences called introns that are transcribed and must be spliced out uh, before the, the message goes out to the uh, aseoplasm to be translated. Eukaryotic genes also have complex upstream regulatory regions, in some cases very complex as we'll see. They have untranslated uh, regions at the front and the hind end of genes called five prime and three prime UTRs and so on. So tremendous increase in complexity in gene structure uh, in eukaryotes. And you can look at this at, at another level, just in terms of the overall genome content. Uh, what we're looking at here are for whole genome sequence and a variety of eukaryotes. And the x-axis is the genome, total genome size. And then the y-axis is simply the content of the genome associated with different types of DNA, exonic coding DNA, intronic DNA, pseudogenes, these are dead genes, uh, and a variety of different transposable elements. And these dashed lines here are isoclines. So if you were to reside on this line here, uh, that would mean 100% of your genome is coding exons. What you can see here in eukaryotes as genomes get larger, there is an increase in coding DNA, but it eventually just levels off. And as the genome continues to get larger, it's not because of an increase in coding DNA, it's because of an increase in all this other stuff, intronic DNA, pseudogenes, transposable elements. So you get to the point out here in vertebrates and land plants where 95% plus of the genome consist of non-coding DNA. Bacteria would be down here, smaller genomes, hugging this line here. Bacteria, for the most part, never have uh, in, introns, uh, certainly not spliceosomal introns that we have. Pseudogenes are very uncommon, and transposable elements are extremely uncommon as well. So prokaryotes not only have streamlined gene structure, but streamlined genomes. And the problem here is that any embellishment that you make to gene structure or genome imposes weak mutational and bioenergetic disadvantages. You make a gene more complex, you've introduced more ways to break the gene, it costs energy to make more DNA, and more uh, RNA, so there's a cost at the bioenergetic level as, as well. So apparently prokaryotes can resist uh, these kinds of embellishments and the accumulation of exogenous DNA because they have large effective population sizes. But this sort of thing accumulates just passively 
in the very large genomes of eukaryotic species, especially multicellular species with very low effective population sizes. So there's been this idea. So that, that takes us to the level of the genome. And you might think that as we move higher up the level of organizations from the DNA to the protein to the cellular level, the possibility of neutral evolution would become uh, less feasible. But there's been this idea floating around that there uh, are routes in which complexities at the cellular level might arise, again, passively, by primarily uh, neutral or so-called non-adaptive pathways. And the, the general ideas here are, are sort of subsumed into this term CNE or constructive neutral evolution. Here's the cartoon version. Imagine you, you start out with a gene, a, a gene with a product A, and then uh, something happens. So there's this other protein in the cell encoded by another locus and it adventitiously uh, binds to the, the surface of A. Apparently there's enough B in the cell that some being drawn off to bind with A is not a problem. This doesn't influence A's function, but what it does is by covering up the surface, part of the surface of A, it enables the accumulation of mutations at that interface that would otherwise be forbidden. They would lead to instability if they weren't covered up by, through interactions with water and so on without being covered up by B. And so this interface between A and B allows the progressive accumulation of conditionally deleterious mutations on A. There could be another uh, mutation on B and that's compensated uh, by, well, not compensated, but it allows another proliferated a mutation on A. And so what you do is you get up the sort of ratchet mechanism building up. So you get an accumulation of uh, mutations on A that would be deleterious if B were to uh, be pulled away. So here, the initial stage, uh, nothing's really going on. But now, if we take B away, we've got an expressed deleterious mutation. So we've got this increase in complexity that's going on. And there was no direct selection for B. It just adventitiously started to bind on A and created a permissive environment by which A can accumulate conditionally deleterious mutations. There's a number of issues with this uh, uh, hypothesis. It does provide a plausible mechanism for the, a ratchet-like increase in complexity, but it also assumes excess capacity of B. There has to be enough B uh, B has some function of its own, but there has to be enough B uh, residing in the cell apparently for some to be diverted to A without causing a, a problem in the cell. And so this excess capacity uh, issue is something to worry about because excess capacity means you're investing in superfluous uh, gene products otherwise. So why would selection not eliminate that? The formalities of all this theory need to be worked out at this point. It's a nice verbal uh, hypothesis, may be correct. In fact, I'll give you one dramatic example that people think is the poster child of constructive neutral evolution, and that has to do with the ribosome. So ribosomes are highly complex molecular machines inside all of our cells, as you know. They're the site where uh, translation occurs. At the heart of the ribosome are three to four ribosomal RNAs. So ribosomal RNAs do the, uh, are, are responsible for most of the catalytic activity uh, in, a, in a, a ribosome. They operate as a ribozyme. But wrapped around these core ribosomal RNAs are many dozens of other proteins. You can see them sort of color-coded here around this. And we have a, what's called a small and a large subunit in the RNA. There's a common core of 34 proteins that all eukaryotes and prokaryotes use. It's a very complex molecular machine. And what's interesting is the, despite the centrality of ribosomes, uh, if you look at the structure of a ribosome in different phylogenetic lineages, you start to find that there's many lineage specific proteins utilized uh, and there's variation in the numbers of proteins among lineages. So this is quite interesting because uh, you might think that ribosomes would be under a strong selection 
possible for everything to be uh, conserved in, in architecture. Ribosomes are very complex, as you can see, with all these proteins wrapping around. They're very expensive to make, and cells don't generally make a whole lot of ribosomes unless they're needed uh, for translation at the immediate time. Now, when you uh, go into, when you think about the comparison between the ribosome structure and bacteria versus eukaryotes, you immediately see uh, these changes, these expansions. So in bacteria, in the, the small and the large subunit, there's 21 and 33 proteins involved in bacterial ribosomes, most of them. When you go into eukaryotic ribosomes, this expands from 21 to 33 and from 33 to 46. So there's been this expansion in the number of proteins, and it's sort of an onion skin-like layering. Uh, the new proteins that get added are on the typically on the outside of the ribosome. It sort of has this flavor of the CNE cartoon that I just presented to you. But there's other things going on as well. As I said, the heart of the ribosome are RNAs, and these are relatively simple in bacteria, and they're typically expanded in eukaryotes. So this is just one part of one of the ribosomal RNAs in E. coli. Here's one in uh, Archaebacterium. But then you get into yeast and in human, you see all of these additions that have been made in these sort of expansion segments. And here's just a plot of the, the size of the small ribosomal subunit and the large uh, and nucleotides. These are uh, the RNAs. Bacteria and archaea are down here. And you can see this tremendous expansion in the size of these ribosomal RNAs in the different uh, eukaryotic lineages, especially a large expansion, the large subunit in invertebrates. There are some cases of mitochondrial ribosomal RNAs that are reduced. I haven't mentioned to this point that in eukaryotes, there are ribosomes encoded by the nuclear genome, as well as ribosomes encoded by the mitochondrial genome ones encoded by the mitochondrial genome are responsible for uh, translating the, the small number of ribosomal, small number of mitochondrial uh, protein coding genes. Another interesting thing here, uh, there's a machinery to make that's used in cells to make ribosomes, to mature them into these uh, big complexes. And in bacteria, there's just a few proteins used in ribosome biogenesis. In eukaryotes, this is expanded to a number, something on the order of 200. So not only an expansion in the size of the ribosome itself, but in the machinery used to make that uh, ribosome. So what's interesting here is there's been this massive increase in investment in ribosomes, a big bioenergetic cost in eukaryotes relative to prokaryotes. And yet there's no evidence that eukaryotic ribosomes are better than those in prokaryotes. A couple of ways that might, this might be looked at, you might think about the translation rate. Maybe eukaryotic ribosomes uh, translate messenger RNAs more rapidly, but no, uh, the range is about 15 to 20. And if anything, bacteria are a bit faster than uh, eukaryotes. Some people have tried to measure the translation error rate. You might think with all these embellishments, the eukaryotic uh, ribosome might have a lower translation error rate, but no, that's not the case either. And by the way, ribosomes aren't all that accurate. They make about a mistake about every uh, one in a hundred to one in a thousand codons. So here's this great increase in complexity of a major expensive molecular machine, and yet no evidence that it's led to any improvements for the cell. So we're going to move on. Uh, well, it's, it's a little early to take a break. So we're going to move on to uh, now think about the origins of novel gene functions in a more uh, genomic, cell biological sort of way. So one of the things we're interested in is uh, genes do evolve novel functions sometimes. There's been a lot of novelties added in the eukaryotic domain. Where do these come from? There's a number of ways that a, a, a gene with a novel function might arise. One way might be nothing more than DNA is mutated, and here's this region of non-coding DNA. And just fortuitously, 
it's picked up a long open reading frame that also fortuitously, I guess, is transcribed and then translated. And maybe on occasion, uh, that produces a product that's good and then would be maintained and promoted by natural selection in the future. And people have gotten much more interested in this. It sounds far-fetched, but there are a number of examples of this occurring in different phylogenetic lineages, probably a minor source of new genes, but it does happen. Another way to get things off the ground is protein promiscuity. Almost all proteins uh, make errors and they occasionally engage with the wrong substrate. That means they have a promiscuous ability to engage with a substrate that suddenly became common and useful. Natural selection could then refine that function in the future. And we'll learn more about that later in the class. I just pointed out biology snowflakes, the so-called multimeric protein complexes. And sometimes when two proteins bind together, uh, a novel function might arise at the interface. And we'll learn more about that later as well. What we'll focus on today uh, primarily is gene duplication. This is a major source of uh, new innovations in cells. Often people think it's a source of uh, new functions of genes. That's called neo-functionalization. But we'll see that a common uh, consequence of gene duplication is not the gain of a new function, but it's partitioning up of old functions. The beauty of gene duplication is you're starting with a, a segment of DNA that you know is already functional and you're duplicating it. So you already have your foot in the door, so to speak. Uh, for the uh, ability of natural selection and mutation to modify you to go down a new route. So this idea about origin of new functions by duplication of old genes been around for a long time uh, from a theoretical perspective, but it wasn't until we started being able to sequence entire genomes that we started to understand just how pervasive duplicate genes are. So this is a dot plot here based on the whole genome sequence of C. elegans, the model nematode that many people work on. And what's done here is we're lining up the five autosomes and the X chromosome from end to end. And we're just going down each chromosome and for each gene we're asking, is there a related copy of that gene somewhere else in the genome? And then we put a dot in this plot here. And a number of them are along the diagonal. So these would be tandem duplicates. You have a gene that uh, makes a offspring duplicate and it's, it's residing next to the original gene. But you can see that many, many of these are also off the diagonal. So you have a duplication and it's moved to another chromosomal location. I don't remember the number here, but it's probably something like a thousand dots on this plot. C. elegans has about 17,000 protein coding genes, and over 5% of them are, are duplicates of each other. So there's a lot of gene duplication going on. And you can get a, in, some insight into the temporal dynamics of the origin of duplicate genes in the following way. If you go back to this plot here, uh, you've got a, each dot represents a pair of genes in the genome. And you can align those with respect to each other uh, then you can sim simply ask the question, how much have they diverged at the nucleotide sequence level? If they're newborns, they'd be 100% identical. And as they age, they independently pick up uh, mutations and they diverge over time. So you can get an age distribution of all the genes in a genome. And here it is for C. elegans. See, there's a very large number that are essentially identical. And then it tapers off as you get to older and older duplicate genes such that very, very few survive for very, very long periods of time. And here's another off the chart sort of example for human genome. You can easily identify about 4,000 duplicate genes in the human genome. We have about 20,000 or so genes. So about 20% of our genes are duplicate. And this, this line is broken here. So we go way off the top here. So again, large number of newborn duplicates in this exponential decay as you get older and older. You can actually use or extend theory that's been developed uh, in demography and in population ecology. These are very similar to uh, profiles that you would get if you're looking at the age distribution of humans in a population. In a rapidly growing population, 
you would get an age distribution of humans that looks like this. There's a lot of newborns and then there's mortality and very few individuals get to live to a long age. And from age distributions, you can write down some simple math and say, given the form of this, what's essentially a survivorship curve, we can estimate the birth rate that's related to the intercept and the death rate, which is related to this rate of decline and this is a law on a log scale, this decline will actually look like a straight line because it's an exponential decay. And so you would get plots that look like this. If you go back here to the youngest duplicate genes, pull out the data points, here's what the data would look like for humans. Here's what it would look like for C. elegans. You can take the slope and that's the rate of loss of duplicate genes over time. And the intercept gives you a measure of the rate of birth per unit time. And so this has been done uh, for quite a few different species. And uh, these are the birth rates of uh, duplicate genes. And so that's human, that's mouse. This is the puffer fish, fruit fly, mosquito, C. elegans, and a few, uh, that's the malarial parasite, a couple of yeast and so on. And this is the, these are the birth rates over a time period in which there's 1% divergent at silent sites. So the silent sites would be divergent at 0.01. And what this is saying, if, if this value were 0.01, this would be saying that a, a typical gene would duplicate at about the same time it takes a nucleotide to be substituted at a so-called silent site. And the average is about 0.0037. So this is telling us that duplicate genes arise. A gene in the genome is as likely to arise uh, by duplication at about the same time as a random nucleotide would change uh, from one nucleotide state to another. So this is a very, very high rate. It's high enough that just incremental gene duplication, each gene just randomly duplicating one by one throughout the genome, the whole genome would be duplicated in a time span of about 100 million years. So that's about the roughly the age of mammals. That's enough time to duplicate every gene in a genome one by one randomly. So a lot of gene duplicate activity. And this, of course, motivates the idea that this might be the source of lots of uh, evolutionary change in phylogenetic lineages over time. So that's incremental gene duplication. But what we've also learned the past few decades, quite surprisingly, is that often genes don't, genes are always duplicating one by one or two by two, small segmental duplications. But whole genome duplication events have been very, very common. And it turns out that quite surprisingly, that there's almost no model system that we work on that hasn't been a victim of at least one whole genome duplication sometime in the ancient past. This was first discovered by Ken Wolf in yeast. Yeast is one of our big model systems. And in 1997, when the, the genome became available, Ken Wolf realized that, wow, yeast has a genome that has enough gene duplicates in it, all of roughly the same age that suggest yeast at one time had a complete genome duplication event in it. We'll talk more about paramecium, ciliated protozoan later, uh, but I'll just point out now that I recall the human genome has about 20,000 genes and this relatively simple unicellular eukaryote has 40,000 genes as a consequence of not one, not two, but maybe even three whole genome duplication events in the past. Many of you will have heard of the plant Arabidopsis thaliana. This is the model plant used in uh, cellular and molecular developmental biology by thousands of labs today. It's been chosen because it has a very uh, simple life cycle. It, it self fertilizes, it's very small. You can go through a generation just a few weeks. When its genome became available, it was realized that Arabidopsis historically has experienced three polyploidization events in its history. The first one was uh, quite ancient, it occurred before the split between monocot and dicot plants. The second one between about 160, 230 million years ago, 
And the third one relatively more recently between 20 and 85 million years ago. So Arabidopsis has a lot of genes uh, because on three different occasions, whole genome was duplicated. And then attrition, like the one I, like the uh, demographic attrition I, I pointed out in the slide before led to gradual reduction. Xenopus labus, this is called the African clawed frog. It's a model system in developmental biology as well. Turns out to be a tetraploid. We're normally diploid by tetraploid, we mean that the whole uh, genome duplicated. So instead of having two chromosomes, Xenopus has four. And it turns out that this whole genome duplication, which we call polyploidization, is very common in the fish lineages. Uh, very, and I'll talk more about this soon. An ancient event occurred deep in the ray fin fish lineage. So prior to the divergence of all the ray fin fishes, but there's also been secondary events in many, many lineages of fish. And that includes the salmon, the carp lineage, the sucker lineage, and so on. Zebrafish, the big model system uh, people work with, and again, in hundreds of labs, turned out to be tetrapods, and I'll return, uh, turn out to be tetraploids uh, relative to tetrapods. So zebrafish uh, has a gene duplication not shared with the human genome. What's interesting here is this is pervasive in eukaryotic lineages, and yet we don't know a single prokaryote that has experienced a whole genome duplication and lived to tell about it. And there's been literally tens of thousands of prokaryotic genome sequenced. So this man here, Susumo Ono, uh, was the first person to think about how gene duplication could lead to the origin of evolutionary novelty. He wrote a very nice book that I encourage you all to look at back in the 70s and suggested that there were two whole genome duplication events at the base of the vertebrate lineage. This was way, way, and this is in the 70s, way before we even dreamed we could sequence DNA, but was based on indirect evidence from, oh, things like uh, histochemical stains of different proteins and a thing we called uh, starch gel electrophoresis and alizymes at the time. So it's a very cute, easy to read book back in the 70s. So he, Ono was a very prescient guy. And here's what he had in mind. So this, this is the, uh, the chordate lineage here. This is the phylogeny. And so down here, we have things like urochordate, sea squirts, and hemichordates, acorn worms, and starfish, uh, echinoderms, sea urchins. And then up here, uh, we have the, the what would be called the, the true chordate lineage. So this is amphioxus, cephalochordates. And at this point in time, uh, dorsal nerve cord evolved and a notochord and gill slits. So we're looking at uh, vertebrate specific innovations. And then we go up to here, the cephalochordates branch off down here. And then we have this other lineage here that leads to the jawless fishes, the lamprey and the hagfishes are the remnants of this lineage today. And then the jawed fishes, which developed split into the so-called ray fin fishes and the lobe fin fishes, which are called tetrapods. These are all the familiar uh, vertebrates outside of fish that you're familiar with. So we're a lobe fin fish technically. And you can see at the base of uh, split between the tetrapods and the ray fin fishes. That's where paired appendages appeared. Uh, jaws appeared here. These are the jawless and the jawed fishes and so on. And I've got another set of events here. Each one of these represents a putative uh, whole genome duplication event. The second one is, in fact, there's many of these. The ray fin fish lineages, I just point out, experience many whole genome duplication events. So Ono oh, was uh, quite a creative guy, and I will uh, play something related to Ono's work. We're supposed to integrate the sciences, and, and many people say we should be integrating the arts and the sciences. You can decide on that, but hopefully you'll be, I'll be able to pull this off. 
Are you able to hear? Anybody able to hear? Somebody shout out if you can hear. There'll be some music playing here. No, I don't hear anything yet. Music? Oh, now I can hear it. So this is music using the DNA sequence of the immunoglobulin gene. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> so I think I have to stop share and then go back into the Okay, we're back. Are you able to see everything now, Josh? No, you'll need to reshare your slides. Oh, I'm, that's right. Okay, this is getting, I knew this would get a bit confusing. In any event, Ono uh, spent some time thinking about how one could uh, just take random DNA sequences and enjoy the music, so to speak. So, uh, so that was Ono's idea. And he argued that without whole genome duplications down here, there just wouldn't be diversification of, of vertebrates. That all this was essential for creating the novel substrate for the evolution of the, the vertebrate lineage. One problem with this is illustrated here. So one organism that a, a large number of investigators have worked on over time is, is the ciliated protozoan. Probably all of you played around with a little bit in general biology class. It's a unicellular ciliate. And it turns out that there's a lot of activity that's occurred in the genome of this bug. So this man here, Tracy Sonneborn, was one of the uh, geneticists to really turn this into a big model system in genetics. And Sonneborn had dozens of different isolates of paramecium in the lab. And they, at the time, they were all called paramecium aurelia. And a lot of good cell biology is being done. This is back in the, the mid 1900s up until the 1970s. And then Sonneborn decided to, to see how many mating types there might be in all these Aurelias. And he started pairing them up and he ended up finding 28 mating types, which is a lot of mating types, not just male, female, but 28 different mating types. But then he gradually realized that these mating types come in pairs. So one and two would mate with each other, but nobody else. Three and four would mate with each other and nobody else and so on. So it turned out he had 14 pairs of mating types, which technically could be viewed as species. He never could bring himself to call them species and call them syngens, but today they have species names. It's ma mainly just a, a preface, prefix put on Aurelia. So there's Prim Aurelia, Bi Aurelia, Tri Aurelia should be in here someplace, Tetra Aurelia, and so on. So it turned out there were 14 different species. He didn't know what was going on genetically at the time. Again, this is before we could sequence DNA, but uh, about a decade or so ago, uh, people started sequencing the DNA. In particular, uh, this woman here is a graduate student in my lab, Casey McGrath, also known as Bombshell Shock because she was on our roller derby team, like to throw people around. Uh, we discovered and with others before us, that there were two whole genome duplications at the base of this Aurelia complex. One occurred roughly a billion years ago, the other were about 300 million years ago. And you can see the reflection of this in the gene number and the genome size. So paramecium caudatum, which might be the one you played around with in the lab, has about 18,000 genes. And all the, and a, a genome size of about 31 uh, megabases. All these other guys have expanded genome sizes and expanded gene numbers. Recall that you know, the human genome has about 20,000 protein coding genes. These guys have up to 50,000. There's a bit of variation among them, uh, but uh, you can see a, a, a huge jump from down here. Now you might think, well, okay, these guys duplicate their genome 18,000. 
you duplicate it once, you're up to 36,000, duplicate it again, so now you're up to 72,000. These guys don't have 72,000 genes. And this again makes the point that the fate of many duplicate genes is eventually for copies just to be lost. The main point I wanna make here is, it, it goes back to some species. So we call this a cryptic species group. They apparently know they're different. They have particular mating types. But unlike Ono's hypothesis for an ancient whole genome duplication spawning uh, morphological diversity explosion, that did not happen at all here. And yet these duplications are ancient uh, way back in the time, this one in particular, the time Ono would have been talking about. In fact, this is even earlier than the one that would have occurred at the base of vertebrates. So I have to be careful about you know, over-interpreting interpreting uh, an event with subsequent changes that have occurred in phylogenetic lineages in terms of cause and effect. Now, let's, uh, let's just take a brief break. I think it's about time. Okay, so now we, uh, we want to think about this in a, a, at least a somewhat more formal sense, the theory of gene duplication and what what actually preserves duplicate genes, as I just pointed out, in many cases, not all duplicate genes are, in fact, in most cases, they're not all preserved, but some cases they're preserved for very long periods of time. These two guys here, JBS Haldane and Herman Muller, uh, had some ideas about gene duplication way back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Again, before we could do anything in, at the DNA level, this is what scientists used to look like before we took off the suits and put on masks. The idea here was, is really quite simple. Um, we start with a single copy gene, and now it's duplicated. I'm just looking at sort of the, the haplotype here, just the, the haploid type. So one, one gene gets duplicated into two. They're initially functionally redundant. They have exactly the same function. We're assuming that we've duplicated the entire span of the gene. And under the classic model, uh, the idea was there's, there's only two alternative fates of the duplicate genes. The only way to preserve a duplicate gene would be one, to invent a new function at the expense of the old function, which is retained by the other copy. So this is called neo-functionalization. There are very few beneficial mutations relative to deleterious mutations that we pointed out last class. So it's generally thought that the usual fate of duplicate genes would be this path down here called non-functionalization. One of the copies picks up a degenerative mutation. It's no longer operable. It's now in the genome as a pseudogene and maybe eventually it will be completely eliminated from the genome. And Mathematical theory was developed over the, the next few years to think about this problem. If we think about this being the usual path, you can then ask, well, how long would it take if you duplicated a gene or a whole genome? How long would it be before at the population level, the, the gene, one of the copies is no longer functional? And so I'm not gonna go through the, the math that uh, underlies this, but this is a plot of the mean time to non-functionalization, this would be as a function of population size. If population size is small, the, the mean time is just one over twice the null mutation rate. And that makes sense. The null mutation rate is the rate of knocking out a, a gene, making it completely non-functional. And here we have two genes, both playing the same game. So that's where you are. And in larger populations, you can pre pre preserve for a, a bit longer uh, simply because of what's sometimes called the masking effect, uh, because one can complement the other uh, in, in, say, uh, individuals that uh, would be a, a null, null homozygote at one level, the other one could compensate. Eventually, though, uh, this masking effect doesn't work and you'll still go extinct in timescales of a million uh, generations or so problem with this, so the theory was great. And the problem was when the theory met the data. So uh, for example, here's some lineages of, of fish here, salmonids, suckers, carp, loaches, there's Arabidopsis, rice, and, and yeast. And 
in the modern world where we can sequence whole genomes, we can get an idea from those survivorship curves what fraction of duplicate genes that arose after a whole genome duplication event, what fraction were still surviving. And you can see here in most of these species, except for yeast, this is a very ancient one, most of them have a very, very large fraction of duplicate genes still surviving over a very uh, relatively uh, long period of time. So according to the classical theory, there just shouldn't be this many surviving, sort of far, far too many genes surviving. So one example would be these fish over here. This is the Salmonid lineage. And those of you who like to fish may realize that these are really wily fish. But uh, recall that the only thing that preserves a duplicate gene under the classic model is the evolution of a new gene function. And there's no evidence that the Salmonid fishes have figured out 20,000 new gene functions. So something else must be going on to explain the long-term preservation of duplicate genes. And so uh, we actually started thinking about this. There's this man here, his name, uh, Dr. Alan Force. And he was a graduate student that I worked with when I used to be at the University of Oregon. And a lot happened uh, since Muller and, and then into the 1980s, 1990s, we realized that genes are much more complex than in that simple model. In particular, we know that genes often have complex regulatory regions. This is just a simple cartoon. Uh, but this led to a, a real change in the way we think about the fates of duplicate genes in a model that was called the duplication degeneration complementation model. So here we start with a single gene, that's the coding region, it's got two regulatory regions. It duplicates, functionally redundant, in principle you were fine with one change, so you could lose the other one and uh, go back to the, the normal situation. And then the first mutation here hits this regulatory region and it seals the fate for this gene. We can't lose this gene now because it's the only one covering expression in head. And apparently in this case, you have to have this gene expressed in head. And the next mutation then dictates what happens in the system. So one thing could happen is either this regulatory element or that coding region got a debilitating mutation. And we're just down this route, classical route of non-functionalization. Another thing that might happen is, wow, this one picked up an expression in some new tissue that was beneficial. We've preserved the prior, we've subdivided the prior expression patterns. One's green, one's blue, but this one's capable of doing two things. That might be good, but most mutations are degenerative, deleterious. And so the alternative thing that might happen is that the second copy it's a degenerative mutation that knocks out its ability to be expressed in thorax. So now we're back to the original sort of phenotypic situation up here, but we've gone from one gene with two subfunctions by degenerative mutations to two genes with single subfunctions. So this has become a, a major uh, explanation for the preservation of duplicate genes over time uh, in different lineages. Uh, this particular paper uh, is one of the most cited papers of all time and uh, it's part of Alan Force's PhD thesis. It's been cited something like 5,000 times. I noticed that the word subfunctionalization has now been cited something like 15,000 times in the literature. So this is one of the most cited genetics papers of all time. People don't cite it anymore because the, the word subfunctionalization has become part of the lexicon and I regret to inform you that Alan Force, the Force is no longer with us. Uh, he's still alive, but he dropped out of science after having this phenomenal uh, PhD thesis. And now I'm gonna tell you what happened to Alan Force. Okay, so uh, we have this theory for subfunctionalization. There's reasons to believe it's a common uh, mechanism to do gene preservation. And it turned out that Alan was uh, actually being co-advised by John Pulsewaite in a zebrafish lab at the time. And people were just starting to sequence genes in zebrafish. Now, of course, we have the whole genome sequence, but one of the things that people were first looking at in zebrafish, it's a model vertebrate system. People are very interested in the Hox genes and development 
And we humans have four Hox, so-called four Hox gene clusters. And uh, there's a man named Angel Amores who was starting to sequence the Hox genes in zebrafish. And he started looking at them and, okay, I've got four, but he really liked doing PCR reactions and so on. And so, okay, now there's five, oh, so there's six. Ooh, let's keep going, seven, eight. There turned out to be eight Hox clusters in zebrafish. And it turned out to be that there's many, many other genes that are in the human genome or the mouse genome in a single copy. There's two copies in zebrafish. So deep in the zebrafish lineage there's a complete duplication of the genome. And this led to the first example of uh, subfunctionalization. So an important gene in development is called the engrail gene. And there's one copy in, of Eng, the engrail one gene in us uh, tetrapods. And there's two in zebrafish. And these are in situ hybridizations of the expression patterns in embryonic zebrafish. And you can see that Ang1, these are the developing thin appendages, those dark spots there. So Ang1 is expressed there, but Ang1b is not expressed there. On the other hand, Ang1b is expressed in the segmental inner neuron. So this is sort of where the vertebral column is developing. And Ang1 is completely silenced there. So if you adhere to the classical model, you'd be thinking, aha, one of these engrail genes evolved a new function, but which one was the original function? Well, it turns out uh, it's not an example of neofunctionalization, it's an example of subfunctionalization because if you look at the expression pattern of N1 in, in mouse embryos, it's expressed in the uh, developing limb appendages and in the segmental inner neuron. So this is a, a nice clean example of developmental level of preservation of duplicate genes by purely by degenerate mutations, loss of subfunctions. There's now hundreds of examples of this in zebrafish. What about unicellular organism, which is our focus here? I'll just go through some quick examples of this in unicellular species. So this is uh, um, an example taken from a uh, gene pair of genes involved in the spindle checkpoint pathway. We'll learn a little bit more about this soon. This is involved in cells making decisions as to when to evolve, uh, when to divide. And uh, what we're looking at here are, uh, it's a phylogeny of this particular gene. Uh, here's one yeast species, an elk group, it has one copy, but Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the famous budding yeast that many people work on, has two copies of this gene. So the, one's called MAD and one's called BUB. And uh, this implies that the, this, these are descendants of that ancient genome duplication yeast that I mentioned. And they have different functions. One's expressed constitutionally in the nucleus. Another has a kinose, kinase domain and it's used in kinetochore. So they have very different functions. But it turns out that the, the Cliveri gene has both functions in this other lineage. And in fact, if you take these two genes out of yeast and give it a transplant from this species, yeast is fine. So this again is a nice example of partitioning of uh, subfunctions in an ancestral gene. What's particularly interesting about this case is that in a number of different lineages, there have been duplications. So here's fly, here's human. These seem to be independent duplications, and there's at least one other one. Oh, the other is Physosaccharomyces pombi. So these are examples of parallel duplications of this gene somehow have been facilitated in, in different phylogenetic lineages. Something has sort of made them predisposed to partitioning up functions like this in different phylogenetic lineages. Here's another example, again in yeast. Uh, yeast has uh, two gene duplicates that are involved in galactose utilization. Galactose is one of the sugars yeast can use. One gene called GAL3 uh, has a regulatory role in the induction of the, the galactose utilization pathway. And the other serves as a galactokinase. So by a kinase, we're talking about something that attaches a phosphate group. And again, you can look at an outgroup species and find out that both these subfunctions were contained back here 
in the ancestral species, it looks something like this. These are regulatory genes with sort of transcription factors binding down on them. And so you can see the ancestor for GAL1, it has, uh, well, initially they were both the same. And then this guy had a rearrangement of regulatory elements and this guy lost a bunch. And as a consequence, they picked up different differences and expression patterns and activities associated with transcription factor binding sites. Here's one other example, again, from yeast. You've, we've learned about ATP synthase before as a molecular machine that generates ATP from ADP by pumping hydrogen ions through here and then whacking things around here and making ATP. But there's a related molecular machine called vacuolar ATP synthase that works in reverse. It uses ATP to drive hydrogen ions to acidify vacuoles. And in most eukaryotes, so there's this ring down here, and in almost all eukaryotes, this is a hexameric ring, and it's an odd sort of situation because it's a hexamer consisting of three of one subunit called VMA, encoded by one gene, and a singleton VMA encoded by another. This is required to get everything to fit together in a ring. But in the fungi, uh, this guy down here, so th these are all related to each other. It was apparently an ancient duplication that led to this. But then in the fungal lineage, the green guy duplicated into what I've illustrated as gold here and, and blue here. So now there's an additional gene and that's inserted into here in the fungal lineage. And so what's happened here is this blue guy has lost its ability to bind here, it can't close the loop, whereas this one can. And this has lost its ability to bind to this guy to the top side of that. And that ensures that the configuration will always be yellow, pink, blue, blue, blue. And so you've got this increase in complexity of vacuolar ATP synthase in the fungal lineage. And yet there's no evidence that this increase in complexity has led to any any advantages in terms of uh, the activity of this enzyme. Let me uh, just flip ahead for a second, see where we, yeah, I'm gonna skip over that last slide uh, because I wanna make sure I get done in time here. Um, one thing you may have noticed here is that we haven't talked anything about where these subfunctions come from. There's plenty of evidence that a duplicate gene preservation by subfunctionalization occurs. But for this to work, we have to have gene subfunctions to start with. So how do we get independently mutable subfunctions? Well, in eukaryotes, upstream regulatory regions are often way more complicated than what I've illustrated here. This is just an example of one gene that's been laboriously dissected in a sea urchin gene, endo 16, just to give you a cartoon version. Well, it turns out that the origin of subfunctions can be explained by exactly the same arguments for the subfunctionalization of whole genes. So imagine here we have something like two tissues, and these could be two locations inside a cell or something. We start out with an ancestral state like this, and the color code tells you which tissue uh, things are expressed in. So this gene. These are, these are regulatory regions, transcription factor binding sites. There's one gene that's expressed in both tissues. But now something's happened here, a small regulatory region change, a motif has changed. So now this binds to a green transcription factor that's specifically expressed in tissue one. So now uh, this is where the transcription factors reside. And you know nothing has changed in terms of expression of the gene in different tissues, but there's dual regulation here and one here. And now another thing happens here, the red uh, transcription factor starts to bind here. So it's specifically binding in this tissue as well. What can happen next is now, since we've got this guy covering this tissue, this guy covering this tissue, we can lose the ancestral element here. And so we've got a partitioning up of regulatory regions for the two tissues. And then what can happen is we simply duplicate this regulatory region. So now we've got two of these going on. 
And if this one loses green and this one loses red, you can think of that as a form of sub-functionalization. Now we've got duplicate, we've got uh, completely separable uh, regulatory regions. So we've evolved from a gene with a simple regulatory structure to one with a modular regulatory structure, each element regulating expression in a different tissue. So to sum up on what we uh, know about gene duplication and the origin of evolutionary novelty, uh, everyone believes that gene duplication is a primary mechanism for organismal complexity to origin. Neofunctionalization is uh, one route to the origin of novel gene features, but we don't think it's the most common route. More commonly, we think uh, what happens is duplicate genes are preserved by partitioning ancestral gene functions, totally driven by degenerative mutations. So here's a case in which completely degenerative mutations are leading to the creative side of evolution. It turns out subfunctionalization works better in populations of small effective sizes. The reason for that is uh, we've, okay, we've covered all the bases. We're doing two things uh, with two copies of the gene, but that's energetically expensive. Now you've got to maintain two genes, maintain two genes to carry out prior functions that were carried out by one. So that's expensive at the genomic level. And as just showed you, the same processes that lead to subfunctionalization of duplicate genes also promote the evolution of the modular forms of gene structure that we require for subfunctionalization to occur. So the idea here is that by facilitating the recurrent emergence and partitioning of gene functions, small population sizes can lead to the passive increase in organismal complexity without any direct selection for such changes. So what we're seeing in all these cases, increase in complexity, totally driven by degenerative mutations. And I'll just skip over that last point and make my final point here is that there's two big engines in evolution. One is change in gene function, cell functions over time, but the over in individual phylogenetic lineages. Second big engine evolution is creation of new lineages by speciation. We touched upon this uh, last class when we were talking about the origin of the mitochondrion and maybe give, giving rise to novel eukaryotic lineages, but we can think about this now as a recurrent problem in all eukaryotic lineages because of our uh, tendency to undergo meiosis every generation to produce gametes. So imagine here, we're talking about gene duplications of purely nuclear encoded genes, diploid individual, we start with two copies of the gene, the white form, the gene's now been duplicated, but say to another chromosome. So now there's a green copy and a white copy. And what can next, and these could be just gene subfunctions as well, but we'll just talk about whole genes. What can happen next is there's some kind of geographic isolating barrier. So we have two populations behaving independently of each other. This one picks up a null mutation that loses the white gene. This one picks up a degenerative mutation that loses the green gene. Now, somehow they're allowed to come back together. They hybridize. Are they still the same species or not? Well, they hybridize and you can see your presence, absence, heterozygote at both loci. You undergo meiosis. You randomly pass one of these two and one of these two down to your gametes. There's a one quarter chance you'll have completely non-functional haploid gametes. And there's a 1 16th chance that those gametes will come together and have completely non-functional diploids. And that's just the game played with one gene duplicate. And as we've seen, there can be hundreds or thousands of gene duplicates in any particular lineage at any point in time. So this is a very, very powerful mechanism for the origin of geographic isolation, uh, origin of reproductive isolation in different lineages. And I'll just leave this sort of teaser here that we'll return to at the end of the class. Did all this whole genome uh, activity, particular maybe before the origin of eukaryotes, did this drive this explosive radiation of the major eukaryotic lineages that we talked about uh, several classes ago? So I think that takes us to the end of today's class, still a couple minutes. And I'll stay on for questions. Um, 
Okay. Uh, any questions? Looks like uh, Deepa has a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering whether people have um, thought more about the deleterious effects of this kind of um, so so there might be some drift associated change in the functions of certain gene copies that allow interacting partners to sort of interact with different subsets of, of each other's total pools, for example, in a cell with different compartments and so on. So is it clear that initially there would not be a big deleterious impact of this, which would sort of work against the sub-functionalization or near-functionalization processes? Well, yeah, I mean, one way there could be a problem. Uh, this isn't a problem if you duplicate a whole genome, but if you duplicate one gene at a time, mm -hmm. you could have some dosage problems, right? Because if you, for example, if you're part of a complex and you want everything to be one to one to one, and now suddenly you're there twice, uh, you can get a, a dosage imbalance. So that's one thing that might select against duplicates right from the, the, the beginning. But dosage, I mean, I remember hearing about this uh, in context of sex chromosome associated mm -hmm. uh, genes, for example, that dosage gets sort of compensated fairly quickly in evolutionary time. It it sounds like, I, I, don't, I don't know how many millions of years were involved, but- yeah. Um, but um, I'm thinking more also about um, as new functions are, are coming up where your interacting partners are now changing. For example, if there's a whole genome duplication followed by a few of those uh, duplicates sort of getting mutations able to, um, able to bind to other proteins that they would not necessarily bind to, or, or I mean, the idea that compartments have evolved in this fashion, for example, in, in eukaryotic cells. Uh, to differentiate between interacting partners that sometimes will just sort of work with one compartment and another compartment has different sets of interacting partners that may have arisen through these kind of duplications. And I always wonder, would there not be deleterious effects of this initially because effectively you're reducing how much of interactions would occur in the correct way initially in the cell, right? Um, because you're not binding to all of the partners that you should be binding to or that the cell would need. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, generally, I, I guess the way it's thought about, I don't know if it's true, but you duplicate a gene and the idea would be you have twice the expression. So you have some degree of freedom to, to move things around. But this is sort of related to my very first point about the CNE model, where you know B is binding to A. And there's just sort of this assumption that there's excess B just floating around that you can uh, you have the liberty to do things with. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of room now. There, there's quite a bit of mathematical theory underlying everything I discussed. Uh, most of that was done by us back in the early 2000s. But I think now that there's so much good cell biology and genomics, now's the time to try and link the theory back to the actual biology that people know about. And those yeast examples that I gave are, are fairly new and start to get at some of the details. Mm -hmm. And with respect to your answer then, is there a relationship between gene expression levels and uh, I guess probability of surviving um, a duplication event for specific genes? Uh, I don't know on a, in a general sense if there is, you might, you might argue that you, you have a problem at the outset if you're a highly expressed gene and you duplicate because it's going to be expensive. Right. You've got, you know, you're just making more product. But one thing, that one slide towards the end that I, I glossed over, uh, it does have to do with expression. And everything I talked about today was what one would call qualitative subfunctionalization. You've got two copies and they're really doing fundamentally different things, expressing different tissues or different subcellular localizations. But you can also have what we call quantitative subfunctionalization. This could work with a, a, a gene that just has one function. 
no subfunctions. You duplicate it. And what can happen is you can get degenerative mutations operating. So now you've, you've doubled the expression maybe of the, the gene, but what can happen over time is you get degenerative mutations and one may go, go up a bit and the other goes down. As long as they end up with the same ancestral expression level, you can get, uh, for a long period of time, you can get preservation. Eventually one will hit the wall though. It'll, it'll have so low expression you know, it's not reinforced by selection and then it will, will disappear. But I think this, this quantitative subfunctionalization is a, another mechanism for you know, fairly long-term preservation. It's just due expression pattern changes, expression level changes. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. So I don't see any of the raised hands. So thanks, Mike. Finally, You're welcome. Yeah, last lecture. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, um, so it was good having you. And I especially like the main message of today that is not everything is adaptive. Somehow one thinks evolution and first thought is adaptation. Yeah, that's so one I'm of glad my happy, <laughs> as you know. I'm glad you stressed that. Yes, so that was very nice. Yeah. Great. So thank well, you sorry much. I couldn't be there in person, but maybe, yeah. maybe someday. Yes, yeah, I, I really hope so. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway, yeah. Bye. Thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot.